Uh, well, welcome everyone to today's uh, talk and the multi-agent systems talk series organized by the multi-agent systems special interest group at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, as always, uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction into what the group is and then I'll hand over to the speaker. My name is uh, Stefano Albrecht. I'm a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and I organize these meetings jointly with uh, Michael Woodridge at Oxford University. So who are we and what do we do? Um, this is the multi-agent systems special interest group. We um, formed uh, just uh, at the beginning of this year and this was following a symposium which we uh, held in, uh, in February uh, 2020 just before the whole pandemic stuff went down so we're really lucky that it still took place and th the idea here was to create a, a sort of national meeting platform for research labs at universities and um, industry and defense which have a strong interest in multi-agent systems research and there is a lot of research in the UK happening in this area but the the area is sort of fragmented over the years and you don't it's not really so clear anymore who's doing what so we thought this would be a good opportunity to bring people together and to um, just map out the landscape uh, of UK-based research in multi-agent systems systems so uh, there are three main activities we uh, well, we organized this initial uh, national symposium on multi-agent systems research. We hope to repeat that again when uh, circumstances allow us. But in the meantime, we're organizing these uh, monthly talk, uh, talks on multi-agent systems, where everyone who is leading a lab at the university or defense who is focused on multi-agent systems research can get in touch with us and uh, we can uh, slot you in. But I can already tell you that for this year, all the remaining slots have already been taken up. We may be able to continue this next year though so please do get in touch uh, we created this uh, virtual uh, um, map uh, where we uh, pinned down all the maps we uh, the, the labs in the uk we are aware of that have a focus or strong interest in multi-agent systems research and if you have a lab and you're not on this map yet and you'd like to be uh, pinned in there as well please get in touch with myself and mike woodridge and with the basic information that you can see in the pins there as well and and we'll get you added to so um yeah so as you can see on that map there's a lot of uh, multi-agent systems focused labs in in the uk and lastly we have a, a mailing list which you see here and that can be used by people who are subscribed uh, to send around opportunities in multi-agent systems research for example job job openings grants um or competitions and, and related things so at the bottom of the slide you, you see the uh, url for the web page for the special interest group and uh, please please have a look if you're interested so that's the brief introduction now i'm handing over to today's speaker i'm really pleased to have a uh, doctor and i need to make sure i pronounce this correctly hold on just a sec uh, Dr. Long Tran Tan from uh, University of Warwick. He recently moved from uh, Southampton University to Warwick, where he's now an associate professor. And he'll tell us about the multi agent systems research in his group. Thank you very much for being here today. And that's me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. Um, let me just share my screen first. Uh, can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes, just uh, maximize, and then I think you're good. Yeah. Here you go. Yep. Okay, so yeah, so first of all, it's a pleasure to be here today, this morning. Um, and I think what you guys are doing, uh, Stefano and, and, and Mike at, at Turing, it's, it's fantastic because, you know, it brings together the multi-agent systems community here in UK um, and give us an you know, opportunity to know each other better. Um, just just a few things before I start my, 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 my talk. So first of all, feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime. Uh, I have made quite a few slides, but these are more like high level explanations of what we have been doing uh, with my students and postdocs. So I can skip whatever you know, needed. So it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a problem if you interrupt. The second thing is that uh, we might be interrupted by an IKEA delivery. Uh, I try to ignore the guy, but he, 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 he presses the, 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 the bell too much and probably I need to, to react to it. So my apologies for that. Hope, I hope it's not gonna happen. So, um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, optimization problems in, in human agents learning. Uh, okay, so to start with, probably you are very familiar with, uh, with at least something similar to this uh, slide already. So 
we are living in a very fortunate uh, uh, time where, where AI and machine learning technologies has been named as one of the you know, biggest uh, inventions of humankind. And, and, and you can see that uh, it's been used uh, in so many areas of our life. Um, because of this, uh, um, more and more, in more and more systems, uh, humans and agent interactions, uh, uh, so the interactions between humans and agent, uh, agents or AI systems uh, cannot be uh, uh, neglected. So we have to take into account the fact that now these systems are working for us, for humans, working with us, and, and sometimes you know, they have to take into account of the fact that humans you know, can be strategic and, 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 and so on and so forth. So if we ignore the human factor, then, then uh, my, my statement is that uh, these systems are not gonna be able to, um, to succeed in many of our, our many areas of our life. Okay, so because of this today, I'm gonna focus on this kind of, uh, of uh, human in the loop type of systems. But let me clarify that uh, I'm not gonna cover all of them. So well, there are quite a few types that I, I in my, in my uh, way of thinking that uh, we can probably separate into two types. You know, it's not a black and white thing, but, uh, but uh, I, I like to use this kind of like separation you know, to, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to highlight the, 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 the pro type of problems I'm, I'm working on. So you can think about like a human agent uh, 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 collaborate uh, collectives as as uh, something like like an ambient intelligence system, like a smart home, for example, like where all the technologies, AI and machine learning technologies, are designed to serve the, the owner, the user. So they they they, they act as some kind of passive or reactive agents. Uh, it typically, they typically support uh, uh, the, the needs of the human users. And, and therefore, there's no re real need to have this kind of like explicit human agent cooperation. Whereas the pro type of problem I'm interested in is more like a, a smart city type of, of problems where, uh, where humans and agents, uh, they might have uh, equally important roles. Uh, and for example, agents can, can give instructions to the humans and tell, the, tell humans to do this and to do that. And so they are, they are more proactive than just you know, reactive and passive agents. And therefore, either cooperation or kind of some kind of competition will happen, will occur between humans and agents or, or within all of them together. Okay, so it is clear uh, because this is, you know, the fundamental part of, 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 uh, of the whole talk. Um, yeah, so if something doesn't, uh, is not clear, then yeah, feel free to, to jump in and ask. Uh, I'm happy to uh, clarify further the things. So uh, my, my research interest is optimization. And uh, because of this, I look at the uh, optimization problems in this uh, human agent learning uh, type of systems where again, uh, humans and agents have, uh, may have uh, equally important roles. Um, so how, what kind of problems, uh, what kind of research challenge may occur in this case? So let me, let me summarize very briefly what typically uh, an optimization process is in general. Uh, so usually we have some kind of objective function, like, right? uh, and for, for which we need to find an optimal solution. Uh, the solution process typically is sequential, unless you are very lucky and you might have you know, analytically uh, solve the problem and you have a course form. Um, but in general, what you have to do is you have to do some kind of search for the, for the efficient solutions. So, and this search is typically sequential, which means that you need to make a decision, you know, which, which uh, solution uh, profile you want to evaluate. And once you evaluate it, uh, you check whether it's, gonna, uh, it's good enough. If it's good enough, then you stop. It's not good enough, and you move on to the next, uh, next uh, candidate. And you repeat it until you, uh, you, get a, uh, you meet the stopping criteria, which is either you know, performance value or some kind of like a time limit or constraint that you run out of, of, of time, you run out of, of resources. Okay, if you think this way, then probably it's clear for you that agents are perfectly designed for this. Right? So we can design them because we are the designers. We can, we can implement these agents or design these agents to perfectly follow this instruction, this type of process. Um, which means that we just need to focus on the, the, the quality of the solution or the quality of the process. But we don't need to worry about the fact that agents will not follow our, our instructions or the instructions of the process. But once we have humans in this process, once we have human in, in, uh, in the loop, the problem is that we might not be able to control them and, and, and force them to follow uh, uh, this process until then. Okay, so let me give you some examples here. So, um, 
back in 2010, so actually between 2010 and 15, we had um, a, a program grant back in Southampton in my previous uh, uh, workplace. Um, it's it's a, it's a, it's a EPS has a multi million pounds worth of of, uh, of project, and uh, and within this project, and the, the main goal of this project was to to understand uh, uh, the research at the you know, theoretical foundations of uh, of human agent collectives, uh, where humans and agents work together. And within this project, uh, my colleagues, my former colleagues, has run quite a few uh, case studies. Uh, first of all, there's one run by uh, uh, Gopal Ramchun. Who, uh, who look at, uh, at simulated uh, uh, disaster, uh, disaster scenarios. Like uh, I think what happened is that uh, in South Sudan there was some nuclear disaster uh, and, and, and we needed to, uh, to use uh, um, uh, agents and, and humans together you know, to evacuate people and so on and so forth. So that was one of the, uh, the, the first use cases, uh, case studies we, we had. And, we, uh, and, 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 and uh, the team ran this, this, uh, this simulation and at the beginning, it ran very well until the point when, when we, uh, when the agent started giving, uh, the agent gave some instructions to human uh, users, and and some people started saying that uh, ah no, I don't want to go there, oh, no, I'm too tired, ah no, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing that, um, which makes the problem a little bit problematic. You know, you, you're not going to be able to solve the, uh, the 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 problem if people don't follow the instructions. Of course, you can argue that uh, this wasn't a, a, a real serious uh, situation, and that's why people didn't take it seriously. But there was another use case, uh, another case study run by Alex Rogers when he was still with Southampton, which is, was like a, um, the design of smart thermostat in homes, uh, which can control and manage you know, energy consumption. And we had the uh, Southampton had um, a, a owner, a small, uh, some houses in a small street behind the campus, and it's, much, uh, it's called uh, Chamberlain Road. I think five or six houses, and and we started in installing a, a smart thermostat in these homes, and um, things went well at, um, at the beginning, as 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 always. But then at a certain point, we just stopped getting data, and it turned out to be that some homeowners uh, they were so scared and so concerned about the fact that there were some weird boxes uh, were in the house uh, with all the wires going out. That actually, one of the the, the owners they threw out the the, the whole box uh, into the street, and it turned out to be that was our data hub. So, uh, so um, there were lots of issues with dealing with humans, uh, uh, and if you have done this uh, similar stuff, then probably you 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 have seen uh, similar uh, situations as well. So the problem, in 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 to sum up what I just said, uh, the, once we have the human factor in the loop, the problem is that uh, um, humans might not follow the instructions, uh, maybe because humans don't understand the instructions, that's why they ignore it, or more serious issues happen when when they don't trust. The, the system, they don't trust the machines, the agents, and that therefore they don't follow. And even in the best case, best scenarios, when when they, they trust the system and they love, they would love to interact with them. But but as as, uh, as the you know uh, the whole interactions goes uh, goes uh, over time, they might lose uh, interest in interacting either because they're annoyed of you know, the, 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 the quantity of interactions or because of, of the fact that they always have to, 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 to do something, to turn to the agent and tell the agents to do this, to do that, or, 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 or being instructed by agents. So there's some kind of an annoyance factor here as well. So that's why, you know, maybe at the beginning they're interested in, in collaborating, but then after that, you know, they, they stop, they stop uh, uh, cooperating with the system. So there are quite a lot of human factors uh, challenges here. Um, so during my, my research, uh, I, I focus on uh, three major, um, higher level type of problems. There are many, many problems and challenges out there, but for me, uh, these three were more interesting. Um, and they, 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 there's a rationale behind this, I will explain to you later, a little bit later. So first of all, I'm interested in how to incentivize people to, uh, to participate in these uh, human agent learning systems. Um, you think like at the beginning, your humans are outside of the system. We need to bring them into the system. That's what the first step. And then the second step is once they're inside, we need to understand that they're not going to be fully collaborative with the, with the system. They might be, but they might not be. So we need to, to, uh, to be able to handle the cases when, when these humans, uh, uh, participants, they might have their own uh, uh, goals, objectives, and, and they may be strategic, they might be selfish. So the system needs to be robust enough to be able to deal with this kind of behavior, not just assuming uh, optimistically and naively that everyone is, is, is collaborating fully. 
And then the last thing that I, I would like to cover today is, is, uh, is uh, when, when here's a system of humans and agents together, and because this typically is an ad hoc kind of agile teaming uh, uh, setting, it's very vulnerable against uh, uh, external threats, especially the security related threats. So we want to make sure that you know, this system is, is, is secure uh, from all kinds of, of, of manipulations and attacks from outside. So that's, that's the rationale behind the separation of these three topics. So kind of like, you know, they come together nicely. Of course, you, you may argue, and you are absolutely right, that after, uh, apart from these three, there are many other challenges. But um, as I said, you know, um, I, I only focus on these three in the last, let's say, five, five or 10 years. OK? So if no you know, high level questions uh, so far, then I let me continue with, uh, let me start the first uh, uh, theme, which is the incentive engineering. This is a joint work with uh, many of my former PhD students uh, and postdocs like uh, Eduardo Bal uh, Balint. Uh, Balint actually is starting PhD with, uh, in Southampton work with me uh, soon. Uh, Henry and, and Dong, they are postdocs and many of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues from Southampton, Danesh Kopal, Sepp, and Nick Jennings, uh, and also Avi Rosenfeld from uh, Jiren uh, College of um, uh, Technology. Okay. So um, incentivizing human participation. Uh, we started, uh, we started um, focusing on this type of problems uh, in, uh, in within this ORCID project, which I already mentioned. Um, I, I think we started using this term there as well. Um, the goal of this, uh, of this type of problem is, is to motivate users to execute certain actions uh, that the system tells them to do. And uh, there's a huge literature uh, about this uh, in other uh, research uh, fields, uh, scientific fields, such as uh, behavioral economics, psychology, marketing, so on and so forth. Uh, but their focus is typically on the on the behavior modeling of of, uh, of, of the users and of the um, engagement uh, type. Mm. Whereas here we we are more interested in the the optimization side of the problem. So basically, we want to have some kind of like a sequential decision making problem plus uh, this incentive engineering model or, or behavior modeling model. Okay. Uh, so we started with a, a simpler uh, version, I would say. Uh, we look at the, um, a very simple uh, human agent uh, uh, learning system, which is uh, the crowdsourcing or human computation uh, setting, where if you're familiar with crowdsourcing, basically what happens, typically what happens is that there's a system which tells you know, uh, people al allocate tasks to, uh, to, to, to crowd, uh, crowd workers, uh, asking them to do micro tasks, mini tasks that they can do very quickly, very cheaply, uh, but of course, sometimes, most of the times very unreliably uh, with low quality uh, results. And then we collect, uh, we collect uh, all, all the results together and, and, and try you know, to uh, integrate them into, into the system. Okay. Um, most, many of the work out there, especially when, when we started this work back in 2010, they, they focus on, on uh, the decision-making part, meaning that uh, how to optimize you know, the decision-making, uh, who, who they should choose you know, to allocate uh, this task to, who would be the best fit for this type of, problem, uh, of task, and so on and so forth. Um, but they ignore the fact that, that the, maybe when you allocate a task to the person, that person might, might uh, uh, ignore or might uh, reject to do the task or decline to do the task and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a, there's a need to look at the, the incentive engineering of, of, of the task allocation, especially when, when this incentive engineering uh, uh, part is, is constrained by some, by some resources, uh, either it's monetary, which I show you later, or, or something else, uh, but, but it's not infinite. Like you, we cannot assume that the resources are, are out uh, there for us forever. Okay, uh, so the challenge of this type of problem is, is that how to balance between you know efficient decision making, uh, which is you know allocating tasks to uh, to uh, different people, while taking into account the fact that this uh, this uh, uh, incentive engineering uh, cost we need to pay for allocating by by incentive engineering them by incentivizing them is limited. Okay, um, probably the most straightforward type of, of incentive engineering is to pay people to do things. And this is, you know, this is uh, uh, exactly what happens with many of the, uh, the crowdsourcing systems out there. They, you pay a little bit of amount to ask them to do some micro tasks. Mm. Think about Amazon Mechanical Turk, or, or you can do, you can, you don't have to pay them, for example, in Zooniverse, but you, know, you rely on the fact that they, uh, they are volunteers and, and, uh, and, and they, uh, they, they are willing to do some of the tasks out there. Okay, 
Um, so one of the so we we focus on theoretical analysis of these type of problems, and one of the the results, uh, the major results I'd like to highlight here is is the work of my former PhD student Eduardo Manigno, who managed to prove the following thing. So it's been known for very long time that uh, if you allocate this uh, this crowdsourcing task in a sequential way in an online setting in like active learning style, then uh, in practice it is better than than a kind of like batch allocation when you allocate at the beginning, uh, you work on these five tasks, you work on these 10 tasks and so, so forth. Um, but, but the theoretical justification of this, uh, of this uh, difference uh, wasn't, uh, is, is, does, didn't exist until very recently. And the re reason behind it is that the, the, the tools, the technical tools we use to do this kind of analysis were not, didn't give us uh, uh, tight uh, performance guarantees, tight performance bounds. So that uh, it was very difficult to theoretically, theoretically prove that by doing this sequential task allocation, we actually get better results and just do the batch uh, allocation at the beginning. So, so Eduardo managed to prove the first uh, uh, to manage to, to design new technical tools you know, to, to actually tighten the bound uh, so that, uh, so that uh, to prove that actually this kind of online learning or online task allocation uh, algorithms indeed do better than, than, than the, the batch allocation ones. Uh, but apart from Eduardo's work, we have also looked at uh, different, uh, uh, more complex task allocation workflows, such as uh, fix, find, fix, verify. So if you, it's a quite a fa uh, famous one, but if you, you're not familiar with it, then basically it, it kind of like uh, you, uh, uh, first you allocate, uh, uh, you ask people to find certain uh, objects or certain tasks. In this case, you know, the original uh, application was uh, what text editor, uh, a text corrector. So to find uh, typos in the text. Uh, second stage is when you, you suggest solutions, uh, um, you suggest uh, fixes, um, and a bunch of uh, candidates uh, will appear at the end of this second stage. And then the third, the third and third stage where you verify, you, know, you ask different type of people to, to check whether these solutions are, are the correct ones. So this is quite a more complex uh, um, type of, of uh, workflow. We also look at the you know, adaptive budget fix, uh, which is you know, the, uh, the, uh, the extension of find fix verify. Mm. And we managed to, to uh, derive uh, uh, theoretical, guarantee, theoretical performance guarantees or, or analysis for this type of, of workflows to optimize the way we uh, allocate the money, we allocate the, the tasks to people so that you, know, you, you know, either minimize the number of, uh, of, of uh, minimize the, uh, the, the total cost, uh, financial cost you need to pay uh, in order to get certain tasks done. Or the, you know, the dual version of this, when you, you have a fixed budget, you want to maximize the number of tasks uh, can be done within this, uh, this, this fixed budget. Okay, um, but as I said earlier, it's not only about money. Right? So we can use other type of, of uh, incentive engineering models to, uh, to incentivize people. And uh, the other way to do it is to look at the user behavior uh, and to uh, try to understand, to model the user behavior as, as it changes over time by, you know, while interacting with the system. And, uh, and once if it, the, the hypothesis behind this is that if you know this, this user behavior well, then actually you can, you can find tasks or you can uh, ask them to do things that they, you believe they are more willingly to, to, uh, to follow the instructions. And, um, and you know, one of the, the, the concrete uh, um, applications we look at this uh, is kind of like a recommender system, like which I just said, that you recommend the, the user to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do this task and to do that task and so on and so forth. And you hope that yeah, they will follow the instructions. But in order to do so, you, know, you need to have some kind of like preference elicitation to understand that what kind of, 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 of preferences they have so that you can meet those, uh, those uh, preferences uh, more efficiently. Now, there's, there are many ways to, do, to, to, find, uh, to, 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 to find out the, the preference of users. Like you can either ask them proactively you know, to, uh, to give you feedback and, uh, and based on this feedback, you learn that what, uh, what type of, uh, of, uh, of preferences they have, you know, this kind of like a survey level or, or my former colleague uh, uh, at, at, uh, in Southampton, they have developed a tool where actually a very nice interactive tool where actually you can, you can, uh, you can uh, annotate uh, the different preferences or different tasks that what, what they, they like to do. Or there's another extreme when you just uh, purely rely on, on, on machine learning algorithms to try to learn. Uh, what uh, what uh, recommendation would be the best, right? But um, but you can see that the, the drawbacks of both the solutions. So one is that if you you proactively ask them to provide the information, actually, there would be uh, too much uh, too many in uh, in a request. So people will get uh, uh, annoyed. 
this is exactly what I was talking about because I think one in one of the uh, the experiments or use cases we run, there was a person who actually said that uh, this is an agent, this is a smart agent. It needs to be it needs to know things better than me. Why it keeps asking questions? Like and and that's that's the kind of like annoyance that, that uh, usually occur. And the the, uh, the drawback of the shortcoming of like just relying on machine learning algorithm is that. Uh, is that the, there will be lots of errors at the beginning, and, and because of this, you know, people will 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 lose interest in, in interacting with the system very very quickly. Um, so both will lead to you know inefficient system usage, and people might leave the system or stop stop uh, interacting with the system. So what we have done is that we look at the uh, the just user annoyance uh, as as a, as a case more uh, uh, thoroughly in more detail. And we came up with the uh, user annoyance, user annoyance aware mechanism, uh, which relies on something called the Pandora's rule. So let's let let me step back a little bit and forget for now. Just forget about annoyance and incentive engineering. Just focus on this following problem. Yeah, this is a classical uh, decision making problem back in uh, 1979 proposed by Westman. Uh, and it's unfortunate that this hasn't been well known as, as the older type of, of decision making models, such as bandit models or reinforcement learning models, but I think it's a very nice one. It's getting popular back to popularity again now. So what happens in this uh, problem is that you have a bunch of uh, uh, boxes or treasure chests. Each treasure chest contains a price, which you don't know, you don't know value, but you know the distribution of this price. Um, so basically you can handle it as a random variable. So your task is to find the maximum price. What you can do is that you can start opening the uh, you can start opening the, uh, the these, these treasure chested boxes, but by opening one box, you need to pay a certain cost for opening it to open it. So different boxes might have different cost, and your utility function is going to be the maximum value you receive so far from opening these boxes and you get the price, it's the maximum price minus the total cost of opening the boxes. So every time you open a box, you pay a cost and that accumulates over time, okay? And what Westman has proved is that there's an optimal solution, optimal in the meaning that it will give you the highest expected value, uh, expected UTT value in the end. And he gave um, a, a, a box opening or treasure chest opening policy strategy. And what it does is that uh, I don't want to go into the details because it's a little more technical, but what happens is that you, for each of the boxes, you can just use you know, the distribution that you know about the price and the cost of the opening the box to calculate a certain index. This is called preservation index. Uh, sorry, reservation index. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, these indexes, these index values only depend on the box itself. Only on depend on and on, on, on no, no, they don't depend on the other boxes. Okay. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna open the box with the highest index. Once we open the, high, the that box, we get the value, we get the price, and then we check this price with the highest remaining index un, of un, unopened boxes out there. And if the the uh, price we receive is higher than the the uh, the uh, the highest remaining index, then we stop. Otherwise, we continue with the, with, the, with the unopened boxes. So we open the next box with the highest uh, uh, remaining index and so on and so forth. Okay, so the, the, the rule is very clear, very simple, but it turns out to be that's optimal uh, in expectation. Okay, so we use this, uh, this model to uh, apply to many of the uh, applications uh, we've been working on. Uh, for example, we look at the appliance usage management in smart homes. Uh, the goal there is, you know, for the agent is to to recommend a, a usage appliance usage plan for the next day, next week, uh, next period of time to the user, hoping that uh, that the plan uh, is energy consumption efficient, uh, reducing the bill of the of the user, but also you know take into account the uh, the preference of the user. For example, if the user doesn't want to turn on the, uh, the washing machine at 3 a.m. in the morning, then it's not going to turn on the washing machine at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so what, what we have done here is that we look at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the preference elicitation model uh, or the problem as follows. So it needs to start asking questions about, about the preference of the user. So asking one question is actually opening one box from the Pandora model. Uh, the information it gets, from with which it calculates you know, the next 
the next schedule of, of our appliance usage is the value of the of the of, of the box and then based on the fact that whether whether the user will like it or not you know it updates this value and uh, and uh, and it calculates the index so basically this pandora framework pandora rule framework gives us the way to choose which questions to ask which information to re to request from the user and more importantly more importantly to know when to stop asking the questions and i think this is you know the main takeaway of our system or the main benefit of our system that is not gonna harass or, or annoy users until the end or, or for a very long time but it knows when to stop interacting so that you know it doesn't exceed the uh, the annoyance much yet or, or doesn't doesn't annoy the user too much okay so this is you know the main takeaway of this slide any questions If not, then, then we also applied similar things to, uh, to uh, social robotics. So uh, we bought uh, two years ago, now it's almost two years ago, we bought a Tiago robot, which is a kind of humanoid uh, robot. It's very nice. It can do lots of nice things. Um, and we, we, uh, we look at the office environment. So we, we set up an office environment where, you know, think about the robot as office helper, supporter, goes uh, in the morning asking around people whether who needs coffee or, 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 or needs some kind of documents or even opening the windows so and so forth. But in order to do so, it needs to understand, you know, the, uh, the not just the daily routine of the, the, the human users, but also, you know, their preferences, what they would like to do at each period of time. And, uh, and, uh, and we look at the, uh, uh, this problem from the, the annoyance perspective that the user uh, the robot needs to interact with the users asking questions uh, do you like coffee now or not or later so on and so forth but we don't want to to uh, to annoy them too much so for example just you know think about the coffee case you don't want to ask the question uh, do you want coffee now and then you uh, do you want coffee five minutes later you want to go coffee 10 uh, 10 minutes later so, on, so that's already annoying right? so you need to be able to to ask, to choose the right question to ask, and also you know, to write a number of questions to ask to, uh, in order to learn this, this preference. And, um, and we, we, uh, we did something similar to the previous case and we published it at IROS. Uh, actually, I'm quite proud of this paper because this is my very first, and uh, right now still the only robotics paper. Yeah, but it was very nice uh, working with the robot. Uh, although on simulations only because we weren't managed to, uh, to uh, that time uh, to, um, to run it properly. But that will be the future work. Okay. And finally, we also had some uh, real world applications uh, um, um, of this kind of like sensitive engineering uh, framework uh, in, in an AI for social good type of problem. So, this is a map of Saigon, uh, I think, in, in Vietnam. And uh, one of the main issues there in Vietnam is that the air pollution there is very bad. It's one of the worst in probably in, in, in the world. Um, the government right now is spending a lot of money on building these uh, uh, huge air quality monitoring stations. But the problem with this is they are very expensive. Second thing is that you know they, they are very high above the ground level, and so they measure something different. So we want to to understand what human body uh, is affected by you know, at the ground level. So we want to build uh, some cheap air pollution monitoring system. But how to do so in Vietnam? Uh, and our, our, uh, our, our goal is to have you know, uh, uh, sustainable uh, and reliable system as well, but then there will be lots of, uh, of, um, of issues, uh, both reliability and sustainability, because you know, they are cheap usually, uh, uh, and they are you know, not, not, not accurate. And, uh, but in order, you know, if, if, uh, if you, you, uh, you want to cover the, another issue is that if you want to cover the larger area, then typically you would need you know, 10,000 of sensors. That's impossible because uh, because uh, the total cost would be uh, not much cheaper than just buying those huge um, uh, sensor stations. So in order to uh, to uh, uh, mitigate this problem, we came up with the idea of of, uh, of using mobile sensors. Because if you look at the, the second picture down here, you can see that a lot of people are riding motorbikes, and I think Vietnam has the densest, uh, had highest density of motorbikes per uh, per, uh, per population. I think. Um, so like roughly like every two person has, owns one motorbike and there are 90 million people, you know, maybe 100 million people there in Vietnam. So 45, 50 million motorbikes in total. So by using this mobile sensor, we hope that we can cover the larger area with much less sensors. But the problem is that the inaccurate reading, of course, like so, uh, so as, as they move along, 
um, that will be less reading. So we need still need more people to, uh, to, to pass it. Debate. And this is where we need this kind of incentive engineering uh, problem. So we need to, to bring people in and make sure that you know, they are aware of this and make sure that you know, they cover uh, the areas that we need them to cover to so that they, they don't just say that, oh, I don't want to go there because I don't like that area. But we need to find a way you know, to make sure that, for example, this area has less readings, so we need to be able to send people there. So this is an ongoing project, but it's a very interesting. Uh, it's not really research, it's more like engineering, but you know, we, can, we can utilize the ideas I, 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 I explained uh, or I mentioned earlier in the previous slides, okay? So that was the first part, any, any questions? Uh, I just realized that I'm at 40, uh, 10, 40 now, so maybe, how much time I have, uh, Stefano, one hour? Well, uh, yeah, if we could wrap up by 10, 50, then we have some time for questions as well. Okay, so be I will be very, very quick with the, with the next two. Okay, so, so the next one is learning with strategic agents. Uh, so the main challenge here is that, is that uh, now we, we move to the case when, when we have agents and humans in, in the system. So we have some kind of multi-agent learning problem. Um, so no coordination. Uh, we, are, we don't assume that everyone is working together but because they are selfish and strategic uh, agents. Uh, what we're interested in is, uh, is uh, system stability. Right? We, we, want, we want to make sure that the, the, uh, the way the, these uh, agents evolve, the behavior of the agents evolve over time, converge to a certain, certain uh, stable uh, uh, state. Uh, the question, can we do this with, uh, with non-cooperative non uh, agents? Um, so we, we, in order to investigate this problem, we look at a very simplistic setting. We look at repeated games uh, without uh, 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 states. So every time they play the same game, um, we assume that agents use some kind of like learning algorithm here, uh, which adaptively uh, uh, change a strategy uh, in order to maximize their utility, for example, and then no, no coordination at all between, between the agents. Um, it turns out to be that if we do this way, then in, in, in general, it's not going to be, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to, to, uh, to converge to any stable solutions. And there've been a lot of research uh, now about this. Um, so before, oh, okay, so I need to say that there are some results about convergence, but those are for convergence on average, meaning that uh, if the agents, we take the, we take the into account uh, the whole time horizon, what the agents has been done doing in, during the time horizon, we take the average of all the behavior, then those kind of average behavior will, will converge. But it's not only really true for the, the last round of the physical convergence. So if you look at the way, for example, in this case, you look at the way the agents are behaving and, and look at their strategy profile, then actually, uh, none of them will, will be able to converge to any any stable solutions. And this is uh, this is a more recent results uh, from 2018. This is uh, uh, quite new. Um, so the question is, you know, uh, if this is a general situation where there's no convergence, then what are the cases where convergence can can happen? And uh, and Das uh, Kalakis uh, and Panagas back in 2018 they proposed a, a case, uh, but the case is very strict. It it requires the underlying game to have a unique uh, equilibrium, um, but, uh, but yeah, in many cases we don't. So what we have done is if we look at a different setting where we assume some kind of asymmetric knowledge. So one player, we call it the leader, has more information about the game, whereas the other you know, uses some kind of like a learning algorithm to learn the game. And it turns out to be that by doing so, uh, we, we managed to, do, to, to, uh, to, uh, to guarantee uh, convergence. And it's just quickly the algorithm. What basically what it does you know, the, from the leader side, from the person who, who knows the system more, is that alternates between two types of algorithm, uh, two types of behavior. Uh, sometimes plays the, uh, the, the this, this, this stable solution. Sometimes you know, plays the, um, the, uh, the, the the learning algorithm itself. You know, alternates between the two. In terms of to be able by doing this, theoretically we can prove that we can achieve this this uh, physical or, or last round convergence result. Okay, and we also apply this to. Um, uh, bunch of, of uh, social good problems. Um, th in this case, you know, we, the motivation behind this problem is the, uh, is the, uh, is the uh, patrolling, uh, we call it green security game, where actually there's some kind of like uh, forest rangers in the patrol of the forest, that we able to catch the poachers. And the question is how to do so. It turns out to be that this is exactly what, uh, what uh, we, uh, a very nice application for our problem, because what we want to do is then to, um, to set up you know, different penalty uh, schemes. And by setting up different penalty schemes, we can force the poachers or, or kind of guide the poachers behavior into some certain regions or some certain behaviors that we like them to, uh, to, to be at. And um, 
that's what we have uh, uh, proposed and, and it got uh, published uh, as an extended abstract at AMAS this year. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the, uh, the application. And then just quickly, the last uh, topic now, yeah. okay, five minutes should be enough, is the learning insecurity game. So remember, we had the first problem when we tried to bring the humans into the, the, the system. Right? And then the second topic is when once they're inside, we try to make sure that they don't misbehave too much. Or even if they misbehave, we try to, to, to control their misbehavior in some, in some degree. And now we look at the third problem, which is, you know, okay, fine. Now we have the human agents together. Now we need to face you know, external threats. You know? And in this case, you know, we look at the problems of, of security games where actually our system is, is playing against some adversary and try to make sure that our system is safe enough or, 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 or protected from this uh, behavior, the, beha the uh, malicious behavior of the opponent. Okay. Um, as already mentioned, you know, once you have humans and loop, the system become more vulnerable. That's why this type of, of problem becomes uh, even more uh, serious and important. Uh, so, question is: How can we how can we deal with this uh, vulnerability? And and the idea behind well, uh, what we have uh, come up with is that uh, to combine game theory with adversarial learning. Right? So, so game theory gives us in this case, you know, security games or, or stackable games is as a kind of like a a uh, defense mechanism, high level defense mechanism, where we can we can uh, shape you know the the worst case scenarios uh, into into some uh, uh, states where where we want them to be or easier to handle, and in the meantime you know we use some kind of adversarial learning to, to both learn and 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 force the agents uh, the opponents to, towards that uh, that uh, that um, a better situation. Okay. Um, so again, we, 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 because we are interested in the theoretical analysis, so we take uh, simplistic uh, uh, settings. So in this case, we, uh, we um, assume that uh, there's some kind of like a resource allocation or defense resource allocation type of problems. So each action and each time step uh, means that you, you, take a, you take a bunch of resources and you, the set of resources that you need to allocate to a set of, of, of targets. Okay, so this kind of like has a combinatorial optimization flavor. We assume that opponents that are very adaptive, that they can learn as well, they can do whatever they want, and they, their goal is to hurt, to, to, to make harm uh, in our system. And, and both, both players, us as well as the, the, the opponent, that we are utility maximizers. Again, we have looked at quite a few uh, um, subsettings. So we look at them uh, mostly focusing on algorithmic design and theoretical analysis of these algorithms. So our first results were to look at you know, the, the, the simple uh, discrete combinatorial resource allocation. And the main motivation was uh, uh, the, the problem of coastal patrolling in the US uh, uh, against uh, illegal fishing in, uh, on, on the US coasts. And, and you can think about these regions as, as, a, as a target, you know, the, the ship, uh, we need to send a patrolling ship there to that region and to patrol for a period of time. So that's a, a simplistic, um, but still combinatorial resource allocation problem. And we provided some nice theoretical results and, and algorithmic design back in uh, 2016. Then we move on to the next problem where um, the, the, the action space now is not, is not uh, um, discrete anymore, but, but, but continues. Uh, and it was motivated by you know, patrolling the uh, traffic. Uh, this is uh, drug and human trafficking routes in the US between the Mexican and US border. And the idea is you know, to place patrolling units, uh, in some cases uh, for some certain time period, you know, to patrol this path. And, uh, and uh, assuming that the, the opponent can, can adaptively change a strategy. Now, if, if something is blocked, that this road has some uh, patrolling units, then probably the opponent would choose another road and so on and so forth. So we need to take this into account as well. And it was, that was done in, in 2017 with uh, Boan and, and his student, former student, Jinju Go from uh, Nanyang. And the last result we have so far is, is, is um, we got back to the discrete case because it turns out to be the discrete case is more uh, difficult than the continuous case. But now we, we work on the graph structure. So we have some kind of graph structure here. And this is right now still theoretical work, but, uh, but uh, we aim in the future to look at some uh, applications, real world applications. Okay, I think it's time now to wrap up. So, uh, um, uh, oh, maybe it's just uh, one more thing. So. Uh, that was uh, that was um, uh, learning in security games, uh, but assuming that the uh, the uh, the opponent, uh, although adaptive, but uh, but uh, they don't have the the, the options to uh, to lie against us. So whatever they do, we observe what they do is the true observation. 
So the next step, we look at the case when, when the opponent can lie about the, uh, the, uh, the, the observation. So they can, they can camouflage, for example. And we, what we offer up is, is not the, the real action they have chosen or not the true, true uh, behavior they would like to have. So in this case, we assume that they can lie about the type, type of like payoff parameters. They can lie that, oh, I did this action. I didn't get three, but instead I only got two, for example, two, two, uh, two rewards. Mm. So the question is, so what, what will happen in this case? And it turns out to be, uh, it's a negative result. It turns out to be that the best way the opponent can do in terms of lying is to pretend to play a zero sum game. Meaning that, you know, whatever we observe them, we're not gonna get any extra information about their utility, that the true utility uh, objectives, okay? Um, it is, that's it, or, or we can do something better. Well, it turns out to be that it only happens is when uh, when asked the defenders, we are oblivious to this kind of manipulation. We, so we assume that what we see is a true value. And in this case, the opponent can, can fool us. But in case we know that there will be manipulations, then actually it turns out to be going to do much better than playing the minimax, the solving the minimax problem. And this is what we, uh, we propose in the, in the uh, paper. Uh, the idea is that we, we, we have this uh, bi-level uh, uh, decision-making, um, actually using the Stuckerberg uh, game theoretic model, where you know, we first announce our policy. We say that I'm gonna, if you show me this, then I'm gonna do that. If you show me something else, I'm gonna do something else. So we announce our policy first, and then we allow the opponent to make you know, the, 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 the announcements and actions. And it turns out to be that if we do this, then we can prove that we can strictly do better, strictly better than, than the minimax uh, type of problems, okay? And we also look at the case when actually the opponent cannot lie about the types, but they can still somehow manipulate uh, the, 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 the data. So they have to stick with one type of, 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 uh, of, the, of lying over time. Uh, then in this case, you know, we ask the question whether we can, uh, we can uh, optimally uh, solve, uh, optimally find the, you know, the, the, the counter action, the optimal counter action. Uh, well, in general, this is very difficult, but, uh, but for a, a, a special case when the underlying model is, is linear, is a machine, uh, sorry, it's a linear regression model, then, then my student, my other student, Nick Bishop has shown that actually there's a way to compute the optimal solution, optimal counteraction in polynomial time. Okay. And yeah, and just to sum up uh, what we have, so uh, um, as you can see that uh, with you know, hum uh, humans in the loop, we need to have some kind of more human friendly AI concepts and human agent learning is, is one type of these, but then, but then there, were, there are lots of challenges caused by the human factor, or caused by the fact that humans are inside the loop and we looked at the three type of problems, incentive engineering, learning with strategic agents, and learning with secu in security games. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lauren. A very good talk, very interesting. Now we have some minutes uh, left for questions, and uh, I think um, we have one question in the chat already by Darminder. If you're still around, you can unmute yourself and just go ahead with the question, please. Uh, Darminder, are you still there? Okay, uh, we can't hear you if you're trying to speak. It seems like you're still muted. But maybe I'm just going to read it out the question anyway, and then you can answer along. So how do you factor in the dynamics of the environment within the human agent partnership? Yeah, so so right now we we ignore the, the changes in the sense that we 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 know that there are changes. We just don't don't factor into the model because our models are more like if you're familiar with adversarial learning, online learning. That actually this is adversarial behavior. We assume that changes can happen arbitrarily uh, from time to time. So we don't we don't model the change. But I agree that uh, that if you you want to to uh, to have more efficient uh, real world applications and then and and in many cases where the changes can be modeled can be factorized into into the the, the model. Then, uh, then, uh, then we should do that. Yeah. But right now, we just ignore it. Uh, we just assume that the, the next change can be arbitrary. Yeah. But thank. Yeah. Very good question. Thank you. Any more questions? I've got one question. Um, oh, I think there's a hand up here. Yeah, come in. Yeah, but Stefan, if you want to go first, it's fine. Uh, no, it's okay. I can go after. Please go ahead. So the question I have it's about the uh, Pandora box um, application that you've you've done for the appliance set, setting so in the theoretical results you needed these reservation prices right that yes. on the distribution 
and the uh, collected reward. So I was wondering what exactly do you do in the application? So where do you take the distribution to define the reservation price and how, how you define the reward for each of the boxes you opened? Yeah, so, so maybe better to look at the concrete applications. So in this case, this is appliance usage. usage. So, so opening a box, asking a question, and then you get some information from the answer. And from the answer, you recalculate the schedule of the appliance usage. And uh, there's some, you have some duty function. That will be the value, OK? What you need is a distribution of weight. So what we did here is that we, uh, we, uh, we used, we combined robust, robust optimization with this. We assume that some certain, certain range of the value. And we just assume that, uh, we just either assume that's a uniform distribution between you know, the, 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 the range, or we just put a, a Gaussian uh, Gaussian, but then we don't take the range, we just you know, put the, the Gaussian into it. So that's, that's a more uh, practical uh, approach. Uh, I don't think it's, a, it's a, you know, theoretically it's, it's not uh, justified. We just you know, did it in, in our application. But in theory, uh, you need to know the distribution in order to calculate the reservation price. It's exactly. Uh, but uh, but uh, but as I said, this is uh, getting more popular now. So there are many more uh, models. Uh, uh, well, not many more, but some more models uh, uh, extending this classical uh, Pandora, where, for example, you can you can choose uh, because right now you need to be to if you want to choose a, a, a price, you want to choose a box, you need to open it first. Right? But but there's there's a version where you don't have to. You can choose anything out there, you know, un unseen boxes. It turns out to be by doing so, the problem is going to be empty hard, and you don't you're not going to have this nice. Uh, uh, optimal policy as this one. Okay, yeah, thanks. So in in in, in a nutshell, you, the inspiration comes from the Pandora box, but you needed to do some shortcuts to apply it. Yeah, yeah. Then there's another shortcut we have we, we have done uh, in real in, in this application is that is that the, the value of the box it can change over time. That's something that you might you you you, you yeah right now you you don't have the theoretical guarantees for that, but that will make the problem a very difficult uh, MVP. Well, even even not MVP, yeah. And the third thing that I'm working on is, is the dependency. You open a box, and you you affect all the boxes. That's that's another problem, which is very interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks, Kamina. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I, I'm interested in the multi-agent learning parts uh, um, that you had in your slides. And I just wanted to ask about some uh, assumptions that weren't quite clear to me. Um, so you're saying uh, there was a slide when you said everyone uses their favorite. Um, yep, yep. Yes. Does that mean they also use the same algorithm? No, and no, no, no. It, so the difference between our proof and, and so you look at the, the, the existing, existing work here, like, uh, like the work from uh, Das Kalakis and Panagias and, and even the, from, uh, from uh, Ratliff's team. Uh, they assume that they all use the uh, same type or, the, or the, you know the, the same the same family, uh, but usually the same the same algorithm. Whereas whereas our results uh, don't require to, so we we manage to extend it to to cover almost all types of, of you know, more popular uh, learning algorithms out there. Which like, I, I don't I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, percentage. But I believe that anything or most of the the theoretical uh, Telically guaranteed uh, algorithms out there, they fall into one of our cases, so we can we can cover all of them, and our results just assume that they play one of the one of these uh, algorithms. Doesn't specify which one. Okay, so I think uh, there's probably a few assumptions that go into this then, right? Because if you just assume that people can use arbitrary learning strategies, it seems impossible to guarantee anything. So, so the, first of all, it's, it's a no regret. Uh, has, it has a property that uh, that uh, that the, the regret on average of average regret converges to zero. The second thing is is a, we call a stability uh, guarantee, which uh, sort of stability uh, assumption, meaning that once you you get into you know a, a right neighborhood of the optimal of the of the stable solution, uh, you're not going to get out from there uh, very fast. So so the property that you you stay there is quite is positive. Um, yeah. So but but it works for repeated games, so simplistic repeated games only. So if once you have a Markov decision or Markov process here, uh, I'm sure that's not going to work well. Yeah. Okay. Well, the the last question I had then is uh, so I expected that you'd have some assumptions like that to, based on which you can build your theory, but. Uh, I think uh, the motivation in this work was that you would um, that you're considering human in the loop, right? So how can 
how realistic is it to assume that humans have no regret properties and other sort of can limit um, properties? Yeah, so 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 I, I didn't have time to mention that uh, that in our system, uh, if someone doesn't follow no regret properties and actually our algorithm turns out to be a utility maximizer, then in that case, you know, we're gonna we're gonna switch into the mode where we we exploit the human user. Okay, so there's some sort of uh, monitoring or modeling happening, and when you detect, um, no, no, the, the, no, the algorithm that doesn't detect, but we we, we prove that it, it happens both. It happens if 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 the opponent is the no regret learner, then we will converge, and we will also maximize our UTT. If if the opponent doesn't follow the no regret property, no regret algorithm, that actually we just we are just UTT maximizer. So we're not gonna put ourselves into the situation where someone will exploit us. So that's that's the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions from anyone else? If not, then I want to thank you again, Long. Uh, thank you for giving the talk and for answering the questions. It was a very nice talk. I want to um, thank everyone for attending as well and just shout out again that um, if you would like to uh, present at this uh, talk series, and um, then, then please uh, reach out to myself and Mike and we try to slot you in, but it would most likely be uh, after Christmas, after New Year, because this year is already booked up. And as I said, the, the talk's been recorded and will be uploaded to the YouTube channel as well. So uh, thank you again, Long, and everyone else. And see yeah, you thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.